Good morning, teenagers. This is Mr. Williams, and I am making this video for AP Physics 1. And what we're going to talk about today is uh, a further exploration of torque and rotational motion. We're going to do a little brief review of torque and rotational motion, and then after we're done with the review, uh, then we'll begin exploring how Newton's second law applies to rotational motion. So as we've learned over the last several days, torque is a concept uh, in rotational motion that is equivalent to force in a straight line motion. So just to be clear, there are two types of motion. There's rotational motion and translational motion. Translational motion is motion in a straight line. Rotational motion motion in a circle. We have learned some kinematic equations. Uh, some of them, uh, the, the three that we learned earlier in the year, apply for straight line motion. And the three that we learned a little bit later apply for rotational motion. So those kinematic equations. are as follows for translation. And rotation. Translation we have change in x is equal to 1 half a t squared plus the initial times time. And Bf squared minus Bi squared is equal to 2a delta x and Vf minus Vi is equal to at. For rotation, we have the equivalent. So the change in the angle is equal to 1 half of the angular acceleration times the time squared plus the initial angular velocity times time. And the final angular velocity squared minus the initial angular velocity squared is equal to 2 times the angular acceleration times the change in the angle. And finally, the final angular velocity minus the initial angular velocity is equal to the angular acceleration times time. So those are our kinematic equations for both translation and rotation. In translational motion, we learned that F is equal to MA. We learned what a force was. A force is a push or a pull. We learned how uh, objects move in a straight line when they're kicked. Um, or hit or struck. Um, and then we also learned about motion in two dimensions, that sometimes a ball, when you hit it, it will go both up and across. There's a lot of things that we learned. So now we're in the night book in chapter seven. And the way I've been teaching it, uh, we've kind of been touching on circular motion across multiple chapters all at the same time. I just went over a little chart with you that's on page 196. You can find it there. And we spent the last several days talking about torque. 
So just as a reminder, torque is the circular equivalent of force. Uh, the symbol is the Greek letter tau. And the definition is uh, tau is equal to the radius times the force times the sine of phi. Where phi is the angle between the force and the radial line. So let's talk just for a minute about what the radial line is. I will remind you that there are three terms. There's the radial axis. It is the straight line. About which an object appears to rotate. And I will remind you that in class, uh, we messed around with the classroom door. If you look over there to the front of the classroom in the left, you'll see it, our big blue door. And the big blue door has those hinges. And if you, so there's a hinge here and then a hinge above it and a third hinge up at the top of the door. And if you were to draw a line straight down through the three hinges, that would be the radial line. So then as the door opens or closes like this, right? So when you, when you come into my classroom or if you leave to go use the restroom, when you push on the door, so if you open out, the door goes this way. So if you push on the door, the door is appearing to describe part of a circular path. So you might it's too big for you to see on the camera, but this is part of a circle as my hand moves. It's part of a circle. And the radial axis is here. My hand, the object, appears to be rotating around that straight line. That's the radial axis. So if this is the door, and a kid comes up and pushes on the door like this, the door begins to rotate because it's getting pushed on. So the kid begins to push. If you draw a straight line from the radial axis out to where the push happens, that straight line is the radial line. And there's some rules about the radial line, or well, just one really. So here's my radial axis. Here's my object that's gonna rotate. If I push here, the line from the radial axis out to the push, it is a, it makes a 90 degree angle to the radial axis. So the radial axis is right here, and this line comes straight out like this. This line here is perpendicular to my pen is perpendicular to the radial axis. The radial line is, it is perpendicular to the radial axis and is a straight line drawn from 
the radial axis to the point where force is applied. This line is perpendicular to, oh, I already wrote that. It's perpendicular to the radial axis. I don't need that. Sorry, I'm a little tired. I came back to school to work on this, and it's like 6.30, so I'm sorry if I'm a little out of it today. It is perpendicular to the radial axis and is a straight line drawn from the radial axis to the point where the force is applied. Yeah, that's good. So that's two of the three terms. Now, the torque. Um, I guess there's more to say about the torque than what I wrote here. The torque is perpendicular to both. No, 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 let's not say it that way. So torque is made up of a couple components. Well, just two, really. It's made, the torque depends on how far you are away from the radial axis. And it also depends on how hard you push. So you remember we all went up to the front of the classroom and we pushed on the door. And the door was a lot easier to push when you were further away uh, from the radial axis. So as R gets bigger, your torque gets bigger. If you were to apply the same force close to the door hinges, that would be, this would be small, then you would not apply a very big torque. But if you applied the same force much further from the door hinges, this would get bigger and you'd have much bigger torque. Another way of thinking about it is when you push much further from the door hinges, then your uh, push becomes much more effective at creating circular motion. So the, the distance R is really referring to the length of the radial line. So R is referring to the length of the radial line. The amount of force you apply also plays a really big role. So if you apply a small force, uh, you don't, the door doesn't go very, uh, it, it does not rotate very quickly. If you apply a, well, that's not right. If you apply a small force, then the door does not uh, experience a large angular acceleration. But if you apply a very large force, the door experiences a much larger angular acceleration. So for practical purposes, if you push uh, with a small push, the door doesn't respond a great deal. But if you push with a much larger push, the door responds much more. Uh, the final bit here is sine of phi. So phi is the angle between your push and the radial line. And uh, this means that if you place your hand on the door and there's a 90 degree angle between your hand and the, uh, the, the door, that your push is at its most effective. So that's when the angle is 90 degrees and so this becomes just one. But at any other angle, it's going to be like, sine of 45 or sine of uh, 30. It's the sine of any angle uh, that is not 90 is going to be, uh, be less than 1. And so you'll be having a smaller and smaller percentage of the force that you push with going towards uh, rotating the object. The reason is, as I showed uh, on the door the other day, if I push on the door uh, at a 45 degree angle, then um, the component of my force that is parallel with the door doesn't go into rotating the door. Only the component of my force that is perpendicular to the door matters for the purposes of rotation. So the angle that you uh, the angle that your force makes with the radial line determines the percentage of the force that you apply that matters as far as rotational motion is concerned. Okay, so that's the that's just a little review.
of what we've done so far. Uh, in your book, the next section is about the center of gravity, but I really don't want to go over that right now. I'm going to skip it and move on to section 7.5. We'll come back to uh, center of gravity in a little bit. Uh, not in this video. though. So in section 7.5, on page 206, we talk about rotational dynamics. Okay. In a straight line, F is equal to MA. So translation. A rotation. This is Newton's second law. We should expect that there should be something similarly true for rotation that if I apply more torque, that the wheel would speed up more quickly. Because this says if I push a soccer ball harder, that the soccer ball's velocity will change more quickly if its mass doesn't change. So over here, I would expect something like if I push harder in a circular way on a wheel, that the wheel's angular acceleration would increase more quickly as long as the wheel's mass doesn't change. And that intuition is correct. There's nothing wrong with that intuition. We are going to have a Newton's second law for rotation. One of the things that makes it wacky is that uh, mass is a little more complicated when we consider rotation. So mass is super simple for translational motion. You just take an object and you uh, place its mass on a scale and you know what its mass is. But for uh, rotation, we have something called, um, well, no, I'm not, I don't want to give you a definition yet. For rotation, where the mass is in the object, if, a, if an object is lumpy or if an object um, it has its mass unevenly distributed, it matters for rotation. Let me think of an example. Mm. Let's, uh, let's say, uh, I was gonna say a baseball bat. I guess that could work, but that, that's kind of complicated. What is a real life example that teenagers would use? Um, need a solid object that you would be familiar with that has an uneven distribution of mass. Uh, I am tired and I'm pulling a blank. I guess a baseball bat is a pretty good example. So I can do this with my pen. So I can kind of rotate my pen. Can you rotate a baseball bat like that? Is it as easy? Well, the baseball bat, the mass is distributed a little differently. The bat is like thicker over here and skinnier over here. And it's not so easy. Uh, you can do it, but you may not, it may not respond like this right at the center of the bat. You may have to shift over towards the more massive end. That's an example, but that's not a good one. Oh, let me go to a classic example. Think about an ice skater. So uh, I'm sure you've seen ice skaters at the Olympics. We live in Southern California, so you... actually some of you do ice skate. I think Alec Trujillo ice skates. So some of you probably ice skate, uh, but some of you may never have gone to an ice skating rink. Uh, anyhow, you've probably seen the Olympics and there'll be figure skaters there on their ice skates and they hold their arms way out and they start to spin. So they're spinning around round and round and round and their arms are way out and then when they bring their arms in close to their chests 
Um, I'm like doing it right here at the desk, but you can't even see me. So I feel silly now. But when the ice skater brings their arms in close to their chest, the ice skater actually speeds up. Like they go faster and faster and faster around in a circle. So their angular uh, acceleration increases. But uh, when they put their hands out, like they spread out uh, their hands, they slow down. So that's weird. And that's something we're going to be explaining. Let's see. I don't think our school actually has a high dive team, but they used to. I was talking to Mr. Davidson about it last year. I think our school used to have a high dive team. But uh, gymnasts and people who dive off uh, the high dive into the pool, people like that also apply similar um, techniques. If you've ever seen an Olympic athlete dive off a high dive, they can, they can tuck. They tuck their bodies in really, really tight like this. And uh, they rotate really, really fast while they're tucked in. So they're falling down off the high beam and they're, and they're tucked in real tight. And then before they hit the water, they spread out. And when they spread out, they quit rotating as quickly. So that allows them to have the control to enter straight into the water because they've slowed down their rotation. These two examples of, of a, a diver diving into a pool off a high dive and a skater spinning round uh, and changing their body's mass by changing the way that they've distributed their weight, those two examples are a clue that mass is a bit more complicated when we talk about uh, when we talk about rotation. The symbol for, well, I don't want to talk about the symbol yet. I'm going to look in your book. I thought we had some common moments of inertia somewhere. We do, and I don't see it. I see it in the back of your book. If you look on page 217 in the bottom left-hand corner, Oh, there it is on page 210 as well. I totally missed it. I went right past it in your book. So I was in the right section as well. Um, moment of inertia is the term that we use in physics. And I know it sounds really weird. This phrase, moment of inertia, is this is the rotational equivalent of mass. Um, the symbol I think it's called IOTA capital IOTA oh your book just uses a capital I alright whatever the symbol is capital I. The, uh, the moment of inertia is different for different shapes or different shapes and arrangements of mass.
calculus is required. To derive, derive means just come up with the moment, M-O-M-E-N-T-S, moments of inertia for most shapes. So this is an algebra-based class. Obviously, I am never going to ask you to figure out the moment of inertia of some object from fundamental principles. What I can do is have you look on page 210 for the moments of inertia. for some common objects. And I'm going to look at that with you right now, so go ahead and get your book out. Let's look on page 210 together. These pictures contain a huge wealth of information, but before we get too deep into it, let me just point out that this is a description in words of the object and the axes. This is a picture of what it looks like, this column. And this column here is going to be the actual formula for moment of inertia. You do not have to come up with it. You just have to be able to use it because this class is algebra-based, not calculus-based. So I'm going to go over these one, two, three, four, and then we'll go over these one, two, three, four. So we're going to talk about these eight. Before we do that, let's just look at these equations and notice the similarities and differences. This is a fraction times ml squared. This is a fraction times ml squared. This is a fraction times m a squared, where a is one of the sides. It will include one of the sides. See here, l is a length. l is a length. This a is a length of one side. This is a fraction times m a squared, where a is a length of one of the sides. This is a fraction times m and r squared, where r is a length from the center out to the edge. This is, there's no fraction here, but 1 over 1 is a fraction, so you can think of this as a fraction times mr squared. This is a fraction times mr squared, and this is a fraction times mr squared. In every case, in all eight of these pictures, you've got a fraction times your straight mass, you, a fraction times the mass as you would normally consider it. So a fraction times the mass multiplied by some distance squared. And that is always going to be the formula for moment of inertia. It's going to be some fraction times the mass times some distance squared. What you need calculus for is to figure out exactly what fraction goes with what shape. And you need some maybe calculus related reasoning sometimes to figure out which distance gets squared. All right, let's begin going over this together. Uh, this is a thin rod, uh, and it is being rotated. It says of any cross-section, which you don't need to worry about. It's a thin rod, and it's being rotated around the center. So this line goes right through the center here, and it's going to be rotated this way. And its moment of inertia is 1 12th times the mass of the object times the length of the object from one end to the other. So not its radius, not the distance from, not the distance from the axis of rotation up to one end, but the entire length. 
All right, now here's a thin rod again, but this time it's being rotated not through the center. So like this is going like this. This is being rotated about one end. So it goes like this. Big circle. And instead of being 1 12th ml squared, it's 1 3rd ml squared. So did its uh, moment of inertia get larger or smaller? Well, which one, which fraction is bigger? A 12th or a third? A third is bigger. So its moment of inertia got bigger. Does that make sense that its rotational mass got bigger? Well, think about your ice skater. Think about your, uh, your um, gymnast or whatever. The, the mass, is it more spread out or less spread out from the center here? Well, it's more. It's more spread out. So its uh, mass essentially got bigger. F equals ma. If you increase the mass and everything else stays the same, what should happen to the acceleration? So uh, then you would expect for the same force, if I played, applied the same force to this and this, which one would uh, respond more quickly? Which one would have a greater acceleration? Well, uh, this one has a larger equivalent mass, so you'd have expected to have a lower equivalent acceleration. This has a lower equivalent mass, so you'd expect it to have a larger equivalent acceleration. Okay, this is a plane, a geometrical plane, or in more plain words, you have plain words. In regular words, you can call it just like a slab. But uh, this is a geometrical plane figure, and it is being rotated through a straight line. Its axis of rotation goes right through the middle. So it would be rotated like this. Um, yeah, it would be like that. And uh, its moment of inertia is 1 12th ma squared, where a is the length of the side uh, that the axis of rotation goes through. This is a plane or slab. And instead of being rotated around the, through the center, it's being rotated on the edge. And this is 1 3rd ma squared, as you can see, more mass is further away from the center, so it is the equivalent of being bigger, or not being bigger, but having more mass. This is like for a straight line, this has more mass, this has less mass. But that's not true. I mean, they have the exact same mass, but for the purposes of Newton's second law in a straight line, it's like this has less mass because it's less spread out from the center. And this is, it's like it has more mass because it's more spread from the center. When you consider rotation, you have to consider both the amount of mass you have and how um, widely distributed it is. The more the mass is uh, held tightly in the center, the more the mass is compacted, uh, the more it acts like it doesn't have a whole lot of mass. The more the mass is spread out, uh, the more it acts like it has a lot of mass. Okay. We'll see that here as well. Uh, these two have the exact same mass, but this mass is all distributed far away from, it's, it's distributed everywhere here. So more of it is, uh, let me say that again. This is a cylinder or a disc. Uh, it's got its rotational axis is through the center. Uh, it has its mass evenly distributed everywhere. This is a hoop. So it has the same amount of mass, but, the, but it's not near the center at all. It's all spread out far to the edge. So this would have to be a lot denser material than this. Um, since it's all spread out here, it's like it has a bigger mass. And mr squared is bigger than 1 half mr squared because this is not nearly as spread out as this is. This is, everything's way at the edge here. This could be at the edge or it could be towards the center or right at the center. So this is, this is more spread out. It has a larger equivalent mass. This is less spread out. So it has a smaller equivalent mass. 
This is a solid sphere and its axis of rotation is about its diameter, two fifths mr squared. This is not a solid sphere. This is a spherical shell, like a basketball with air pumped in the middle. This is a solid sphere like a bowling ball. So the solid sphere, if they have the exact same masses, this solid sphere, it, it, its mass is more evenly distributed, so it's less spread out. This mass is not evenly distributed. It's all just going to be uh, on the outside edge. So you'd expect this to be more spread out and this less. So this is going to have a larger uh, equivalent mass, and this will have a smaller. And you see that the fractions spare that out. This is 2 thirds, and that's 2 fifths. Therefore, going back to what I was going to show you before, for rotational motion, torque. Uh, why am I drawing? Yeah, torque is equal to the moment of inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. F equals MA for translation. Torque equals moment of inertia times angular acceleration for rotation. All right, it's time for you to practice on this. I know it's a lot. I suggest you read this section. Let me give you a homework assignment. So your homework. This is going to be page 221. And I would like you to do just one problem, number 37. I will be back on Friday. So please have that problem attempted, and I'll go over it with you when I see you next. Have a wonderful day, kids. I'll see you Friday.